Why do I love Christian concern? I loved, I do love Christian concern. I admire Christian concern. I respect them and I love them, but I disagree with their main narrative. And I want to just take a few minutes to explain why that is and why it matters so much. This video is an expression of standing with Christian concern and, in fact, all of our parachurch organisations of the same ilk, Coalition for Marriage, C4M, or the Christian Institute, as two other examples. This is an expression of standing with you guys not attacking you. But I am wanting to be honest in saying that I read the ambassador magazine that came through the door yesterday and uh, I love so much about Christian Concern. I admire and have even worked, done some freelance work and hopefully will continue to after this video, um, supporting Christian Concern. So this is not um, a polemic to attack. It's, I think, a prophetic word that I can't not bring, I can't not say. Um, I love so much about Christian Concern. I love their courage. I love their work with people who are um, persecuted, discriminated against. I love their media. I love all of their publications. I love Andrea's courage and strength. I love, An I love you, Andrea and some of the guys who I had less contact with. There's so much that I love in it, but as I say, when I read this Ambassador magazine last night, my heart, my heart churned. I'll always remember somebody once giving this analogy to do with a shirt and the holes and the buttons of a shirt, and that if the top button is not in the top hole, even if the top button is in the second hole, so it doesn't, might not, you might not think is majorly, wrong. The point is every button will be in the wrong hole and the shirt will be uncomfortable to wear. It will look ridiculous. You just wouldn't do it. You'd correct the top button in the top hole. And that's what I want to try and communicate about now, which is to say that if our top button is in the wrong hole, we're not going to see what we all long to see, which is God move in this nation. Think about those holes in terms of all of the social cultural work that, that CC stand for, social justice, work with children and families, standing up for work-based, workplace problems, discriminations, preachers on the streets being arrested, all of those different, think about those as being the buttons that need to be in, in the right holes. All the things that we love about Christian concern. Why do I think that all the buttons are not in the right holes. Why do I think that the top button is in the wrong hole? Well, let me explain quickly in terms of what I see in this magazine and what I don't. Firstly, what's in this magazine is, a, I think, at the basis of everything, really, has been the challenge, the judicial review that challenged the government's forcibly closing the churches in 2020. And that that was overstepping the mark, that the, that it was illegal, that the church should never have gone along with it, that it's persecution, it's discrimination, and it's part of you would you would have to read into that that that's part of what the enemy wanted. And I actually think that's wrong, and I don't think this is a small thing. I think this makes all the difference. This will either set us aright, or it will continue to perpetuate where we have languished in unfaithful chaos, which is to say that in 2020, in January 2020, 
we prophesied very uncomfortably and we didn't bring it like a prophecy. We didn't even know that it was a prophecy really at the time. We just knew it was a burden, which was to pray before any sign of a pandemic that the Lord would close, that every church would close, be forcibly closed in order that every church would enter into repentance and prayer. That was in January, early January 2020. And less than 10 weeks later, that happened, or 12 weeks later, that actually happened. It, every church up and down the country was forcibly closed. And I've I've done a video on this. I did a video about this at the end of 2020, entitled The Year the Church is Closed. But this is the thing. We can't move beyond that. We can't suddenly think, yeah, we're going to be part of a judicial review because the church is shouldn't have been closed, it was illegal, it was of the devil, when actually we believe that the Lord has shown us in advance that this is what he was doing, this is what he wanted. So the narrative is that the churches should never have closed, we should never have gone along with that. And I think in some senses, that's it's right to point to the discrimination and elements of persecution. But that's not, that's not the main thing that's going on here. The main thing is that the churches were closed by God because of our gross unfaithfulness. I can't move beyond that. If I think about it for you, if if somebody had if God had said to you in January 2020, call the churches of the country to close in order to facilitate prayer and repentance, that then happened. What would you do? Would it be faithful? Would it be true to your heart? Would you be even morally or intellectually honest to change the narrative to be part of this judicial review in this magazine? No, it's not. And that's not. I don't I I I would I would walk off the edge of a cliff based on this conviction that this is not what God is saying or doing and how we are so far nationally missing what he is doing. Christian concern are the very best. I lo- as I say, I love Christian concern. I love what you guys do. And you are the very best in this country, along with maybe a couple of others of parachurch organizations. But frankly, if the church were in the condition that we should be, there would be no need, arguably, for any parachurch organizations. Over the course of the last year, it's amazed me the number of times... I might even, and I don't talk about it all the time, but if somebody asks me what do you think is going on or it seems relevant, and I mention what happened in January 2020 regarding the closure of the churches and that being before any kind of landscape for that even being possible seemed on the horizon, it just amazes me how quickly people just, it kind of washes over them. It's like water off a duck's back. It's like whatever, you know. I'm not sure if I know I've heard anybody else calling for the churches to close. I've not heard prophecies being brought in advance of something as national as that, have you? And that's not to make a big deal of us. We are, in a sense, a, a prophetic um, embodiment of the sickness of the church. That's going on in our lives. That's going on in my body. I carry daily a sense of the brokenness in the body of Christ. I believe that the truth is that God closed our churches. The Lord of glory, the one who's coming again, closed our churches because of our gross unfaithfulness. The very fact that churches have been showcased, church pastors have been up in arms because of the closure of our churches is, for me, a symptom of our chaos, is a symptom of our unfaithfulness and our pride and our arrogance. I'm about to show you some examples now of, in having read through this magazine, why that strikes me even more strongly this morning. What do I mean by that? Well, I think this is what I see in Christian Concerns magazine. I see lots of phenomenal work. I see lots of phenomenal causes, strong leadership in lots of different ways, compassionate causes, successes, triumphs, some some degree of burden. But ultimately, what I see is on the front cover an emphasis, a narrative to do with churches being unlocked. And that central to that has been this thing of it's been unfair and it's been wrong and it's been illegal that the churches were closed. 
So what we're talking about generally is what's in this magazine and what's not in it. I'm going to come to the second bit, what's not in it, in a minute. But let's just have a quick look at what is a fine publication. So one of the things I love about Christian Concern is their attention to detail and their pursuit of excellence. Let's just see, look, here we are. Church, Church, un Church Unlocked, moving forward together in an uncertain world. Now, that's the desire, I think, for everybody whose heart is set towards faithfulness even where some of us currently are not hearing what God is saying properly, I don't think, there is still the desire to be faithful. And I think that's, that's who I'm appealing to this morning. Everybody at CC, everybody at C4M, everybody at the Christian Institute, everybody whose heart at this stage is aware that God is disrupting his people because we do want to be unlocked in the ways that I don't think we currently understand what that means. Moving forward together in an uncertain world. Let's just go to page 20 because this is where this feature, okay, standing with church leaders for me is where having thought about this and prayed about it and just feeling the sense of the agitation of the Holy Spirit. And that's the, a good way of putting it. I feel agitated by this. This is, as I read this this morning, this is where it started to just kind of clarify for me. You've got a a number of different leaders here. You've got a guy called Daniel um, from Milton Keynes, another chap called William from the Tron Church, just around the corner from where we are here in Edinburgh uh, at the Tron Church in Glasgow. John, John William Noble at Grace Church, again in Aberdeen. So there's a couple of Scottish churches here. Then you've got Peter Bellingham uh, in Shrewsbury, Peter Sandlin, who gave a lovely tribute to our late friend Melvin Tinker recently, and then another chap called Oliver um, in Ramsbottom. Now, I don't know any of these guys individually. I don't know uh, any of them personally at all. And this isn't, again, attacking them, but I'm trying to interpret or at least help you to see what I'm seeing, which is that through these accounts, which is really to do with the most significant year, I think, in world and church history that there's ever been and that we are still in the throes of, the middle of. You, you're not, I'm not going to read them all for the sake of time, but you'll notice I've highlighted a couple of bits and question marks here and so on. Please read these and ask this question. Is what you're hearing, is what you're reading reflective of, of hearts, minds, men of God, who have been flawed by the reality of the state of the church. I'm trying to think of another way of saying that. As you read these accounts of church leaders, are you hearing repentance? Are you hearing a sense of sobered cellar and being flawed? Are you, are you hearing the, the sense of being cut by the Spirit of God? I'm not. When I read these posts, when I read these accounts, I'm hearing from across the board slightly different versions of the same thing, which is that we needed to challenge the government because what they did was wrong. We needed to call the government to account, all the while manifestly not showing any evidence at all that we ourselves, as the church, should be the ones being called to account for the state in which we are in, the gross unfaithfulness of the church that says nothing about abortion, the gross unfaithfulness of the church that says nothing about homosexuality or marriage in UK law being redefined, the lukewarmness, the chaos that doesn't seem to be able to confront agendas and ideologies to do with transgenderism that are ruining our children and their children and generations to come, the chaos that doesn't want to teach solid biblical doctrine for fear of being seen as being not pastorally sensitive. We are, guys, we are in a condition that warrants repentance for the long term. We're not, we're not talking about a week of prayer. We're talking about 40 years of prayer. When I read these examples here, and I've hi hi highlighted this one from William in Glasgow, he's talking about from the start of the pandemic, columnists and the press had asked, where is the spiritual leadership? That's a very good question. Where is the spiritual leadership? 
And by the way, I think, I think many, many unsaved people are asking that question. There's a false dichotomy here about pre preaching and proclaiming the gospel, evangelism and so on. As though that's the thing that we can't have suffer at all costs. Make sure that the, the proclamation of the gospel continues because this is the time in history where people need it the most. Let me tell you, looking at my neighbours across the road who don't know Jesus, the one thing that they don't need at the minute is churches open that are unfaithful. It would be a stronger witness of the gospel for our unsaved neighbours to see churches up and down the country closed and in a, in a place and in a state of long-term repentance. Such is the state of the church. Such is the height that we have fought. That would be a stronger gospel proclamation than the, the false dichotomy and the false assumption that our church is being open is going to help people. Look at what's being said here um, by this guy, William. And again, I don't know William. Many Christians throughout the nation have been ashamed at the absence of clear voices from the church leadership. We wanted the real church's voice to be heard, not just preaching health and safety, that's good, but proclaiming hope and salvation. And the events surrounding the judicial review gave opportunity for the voice of the real church to be heard. Gave a chance for the real voice of the church to be heard. That's not the point. That's not the point. A friend of mine, Steve Buckley, made this example. It's like a petulant child or somebody at work who's not doing their job properly asking for promotion. It is like a petulant child misbehaving and looking for a special treat. It is like a worker not doing their job properly and still hoping for promotion. This is, this is what's happening here, is that there is a failure to heed the voice of the Lord and at the same time still maintaining the narrative, which is that you know, society just need to hear the voice of the church or whatever. Look at what John William Noble from Aberdeen says. And I've highlighted it here. You can see this on page 21 if you've got the magazine. He's talking about our church attendance has more than doubled. In one sense, I don't care. <laughs> I really don't care if your church has doubled in size. Again, I think that could be a bad thing if you haven't felt this weight at what's going on in, in the church and if you haven't heard the voice of the Lord. Your church congregation doubling in size doesn't mean that's healthy or that that's good just because your church is busier. I heard, a, I, heard I think it was a church of Scotland. It was, a, it was one of the establishments at the very beginning of lockdown saying that our, our views have gone through the roof online. I mean, what does that mean, guys? We, you, you, we have to be more switched on than this. It's like just because a church has doubled in size doesn't mean to say that's good or that that's God. This question mark here, look, our, own, our church has grown stronger as a result of this situation and we are now close to purchasing our own building. Again, is that what God is really saying? Is that, it's the UK blessing. It's the UK blessing. That if, we, if we're in a position suddenly where our churches have doubled in size and then and we can be in a position of buying a building, then that must be God, right? No, guys, this is not acceptable. And I can't say this any other way other than if we continue along this way of thinking, we have to learn to think differently. And guys, this is what happens when repentance happens is that we learn to hear his voice, and we, that means that we think differently. We can't think differently. We can't pray differently until we stop. People say to me occasionally, it's like, well, what, what next? It's like, I don't know. Until the church are willing, until these guys are willing to stop properly, we're not going to hear him. We're not going to receive wisdom. Final point from this, 
Our church has grown stronger as a result of this situation. We've just we've just read that. We are thankful that the Lord has sustained our church and blessed us with spiritual and numerical growth in a time where so many churches have been reporting a decline in attendance and church commitment. We cry out to the Lord that in a time of judgment against the church, that the Lord will remember mercy. This is what I'm saying about the beginnings or rumblings of the kind of stuff that we should be hearing across the board. If the church are crying out for mercy, without repentance you can cry out for mercy can't you again it's the analogy of a child you can say sorry and not mean it i'm not hearing i'm not hearing a church that have been flawed by the recognition that we are wicked in our idolatry that we are lukewarm and that he will spit from his mouth those who remain. He stands among the lampstands and he is calling his people to stop. Stop everything that's gone on before and enter into a long-term period of repentance. It's as simple as that. One more example from here, okay, on page 22, this is Peter Sandlin. Um, At the end of his comments, he says, and this is this is Peter talking about the government. Okay, so this is the top button in the wrong hole. This is the calling of the government to account. While I think the government should call the church to account, if we want to be radical about it, because I think the church have abdicated their responsibility, which is why there's an evil government, which is why we've got an immoral prime minister voted in, which is why the countries in the state, the church, should lead the way on matters of morality and integrity and righteousness. And so this is Peter giving an account or his view on the government's responsibility and that more work needs to be done in the future, I don't know, to prevent this kind of thing happening again or whatever. He's talking about the the lesson needs to be more widely learned and acted on as the spiritual realities have not changed. Let me read this whole thing. The opportunity to pray with and discuss spiritual and practical concerns about freedoms of religion with other church ministers was very helpful. So he's talking here about spiritual and practical concerns about freedoms of religion, freedoms of speech, freedoms of whatever. The realism, hard graft and complexity of legal work were all on display display and reminded me how hard one and precarious freedoms are. In my view, the legal challenge succeeded in Westminster. I very much doubt that the freedoms churches had confirmed after the challenge would have been so extensive had it not been made clear that some churches would do all they could to resist government encroachment on the church's God-ordained remit. I very much doubt that the freedoms churches had confirmed after them. Did churches need freedoms conferred upon them during lockdown? Was that what God wanted us to focus on, have, demand? Demand? Is that what he... Was that his prescription to us? I don't think it was. But this is the bit. This lesson that Peter's talking about, that the government need to learn is actually a lesson that we need to learn. That that lesson needs to be more widely learned and acted on as the spiritual realities have not changed. Exactly, but not exactly. The spiritual realities haven't changed. I'm not sure what has changed within the church. I'm not sure what has changed, particularly within churches who have complained to the government for having been closed. It's a spiritual reality that I think is so manifestly obvious to me that hasn't changed because of what I'm about to address now, which is what's not in this magazine. We've just focused on what is in this magazine. Now let's just for a minute or two think about what's not in this magazine. As gently and as lovingly as I know how to, I want to say that what I don't hear and what I don't read in this magazine 
are letters of apology from church leaders and churches, letters of repentance, letters that convey lament, tears, travail, heart cutting by the spirit and by the word of God. I don't read any good news stories of churches that recognize their unfaithfulness, their, their cowardice, their silence in the face of moral abhorrences and social abhorrences like abortion and transgender ideology. I don't hear anything. I don't hear anything. I don't read anything of that. And so as we reflect on 2021, having reflected on 2020, I'm reading the best that the church has to offer. I'm reading the very best in the land. And I'm not hearing the response that I think is the only response that is gonna unlock the sense of hopelessness and despair in the presence of such oppressive, accelerating, antichrist evil. Until the church stop with this adapting mentality where we just need to shift it all online and we just need to get better at WhatsApp and YouTube and Zoom, until we're prepared to go into the wilderness, nothing is gonna change. We are gonna to continue to wear shirts with buttons that aren't in the right holes. And to finish, I just wanna read um, Deuteronomy 8. If you've got your Bible, please just pull it up. This is Deuteronomy 8. And this is what I was saying earlier about a prophetic fleshing out of a spiritual reality that I can testify to in my own body and I'm increasingly convinced relates to the burden that I personally carry for the church, which is to see the church truly repent and truly humble themselves for 2 Chronicles 7, 14 to be genuinely responded to in faith, and it's not. This is Deuteronomy 8. The whole commandment that I command you today shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give your fathers. That's the Lord's will for us, is that we would go in and possess that which he's promised us. Verse two, and you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. God's humbling his people. He wants to humble his people and he's testing us guys. And in my humble opinion, the contents in this magazine or, the, or what's not in this magazine, we're not passing the test. Verse three, and he humbled you again. Look at the number of times. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna. He let you hunger. I think he's letting us hunger, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Every single word. I heard of church leaders this week, apparently high quality church leaders, who agreed in principle with a doctrinal statement about abortion and about life affirmation, but who weren't willing to sign, who weren't willing to put their money where their mouth is. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds or comes from the mouth of the Lord. Where is our money, guys? Is our money where our mouths are? Verse 4, your clothing did not wear out and you, your foot did not swell these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. This is adoption. This, this is not, this closure of forcing of the churches to, to be locked is not punishment in order to... Um, condemn is chastisement to enable us to heal. Verse 7 of Deuteronomy 8, for the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs flowing out in the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey. This is a good, good God, is a good, good father. Verse 9, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper and you shall eat and be full and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Verse 11, take care 
lest you forget the Lord. How much in all of our chat about him have we fundamentally just forgotten him? Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have, have built good houses and have eaten and are full and, then, and you've lived in them, verse 13, and when your herds and flocks multiply, hello, and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have you have is multiplied, then your heart may be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through that great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do good in the, to do you good in the land. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand had gotten, have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gave you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so shall you perish, because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God, and I believe that the voice of the Lord our God to be obeyed is to prioritize long-term repentance. If we think that an appropriate commensurate response to our condition is to have a week of prayer, we have not even begun to recognize the mess that we're in. It could be more than conceivable that God leads his people through a radical disruptive upheaval of repentance for the next four decades. Can you imagine that? Until we understand that we really don't understand repentance, we're not going to hear what we need to hear. And I love CC, I love Christian Concern, I love Andrew Williams, I do. I love and respect and admire and celebrate but this is not what God is saying. This top button needs to be put in the right hole. And I don't know what that looks like exactly, but I recognize when I'm not hearing the right things and when in fact I'm reading the things that demonstrate and are symptomatic of the very problem itself. Father, what other words are there other than your word? And I pray that this word from Deuteronomy 8 that we wouldn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth would be something that we come to truly be able to testify as being true in our land, in our churches. Lord, I pray for this unwillingness to be humble, unwillingness to stop, unwillingness for our priorities to be surrendered, to be slaughtered, and so that your priorities and your desire for healing through the heart cutting of repentance would happen. And Lord, where that's not even begun, I pray do it. I pray that where it's begun, bless that, let it accelerate and continue. Lord, where there is no preparedness, no willingness to do that, cut that out in a different way. Remove people from leadership who have no intention of repenting and leading their flocks in repentance. Lord, I do pray for mercy and I pray that there would be a, a call and a cry for mercy from the place of repentance, not arrogant, proudful, foot stamping petulance by so much of the church. Please forgive us. Please heal us. Please lead us into the land that you have promised in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.